welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I am Bill Fox, your worship associate this morning, and will be assisting Ed Sharples and Nico Van Ostron in this morning's service, as well as Chalice Leiter Holly Cordeville and hymn leader Dominic McGrokart. We are joined today by our music directors, Stephen and Abba Deering, with technical support from Sarah Constantakis and Zoom greeter, Mary Jo Ebert. BUC is a Unitarian Universalist congregation in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Even in our virtual format, we are a thriving community with a place for everyone. Social justice is an essential component of, of our church life. We are a capital W welcoming congregation and a green sanctuary congregation. Our show, social justice work this year is focused on civic engagement, racial inequality, economic inequality, and environmental justice. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030, and then later posted on Facebook. After the service, we invite you to stay for a virtual coffee hour. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we extend a special welcome to you. We have three announcements this morning. This Tuesday, April 6th at 7 p.m., join Keith Ensroth on Facebook Live for our monthly Vesper service. This is a joyful yet introspective evening service that centers on gratitude for the day that has passed and welcomes the night that is beginning. The service will include the lighting of memorial candles, candles of concern, and candles of hope and joy. Names and information for candle lighting can be submitted via the link on our website or shared in comments on the Facebook Live video. View the service live. Visit the Birmingham Unitarian Church Facebook page this Tuesday at 7 p.m. The video will also remain on Facebook for later viewing. This coming Saturday morning, April 10th at 10 a.m., join the social and environmental justice team for At the Corner of Environment and Race in Southeast Michigan. We'll welcome State Senator Stephanie Chang and Professor Shay Howell, both from Detroit, explore how environmental hazards often cause particular harm to communities of color and low income. The two leaders will share their expertise from the front lines, including ways that we can push for environmental solutions that serve everyone, including those most vulnerable. Zoom access info is on the church calendar. Then this Saturday evening, April 10th at 7 p.m., join the membership team for April Mixer and Game Night, a fun-filled evening of icebreakers, games, laughter, connection, and of course, prizes. Hope to see you there. Zoom access info is on the church calendar. This morning's Easter service is on life eternal. And now music leads us into our worship service. For this morning's prayer, I thought we'd waltz into spring and Easter. Yeah, waltz by Augustin Barrios Manjore, Peregrine composer.
Cordova will light our chalice. These sparks that fuel a building flame bring the end of winter shade. Birds call from tree to tree, brush, flowers, and hearts bloom, waking the minds of you in me after the warmer night's gentle gloom. Wind carries promising seeds off to grow somewhere new, the sun giving them all their needs in the sky big and blue. What does spring mean to you? Hi, my name is Dominic Mangulkar, and I and I will be leading our our first hymn, Woyaya. <laughs> The Biblical Book of Mark, otherwise known as the Gospel of Mark, is the oldest of the Synoptic Gospels, those being Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Although Mark is the second, not the first in the series, it is the oldest of the three. The Gospel of Mark was written between 70 and 75 AD and it centers on Jesus as teacher rather than Jesus as divinity. Mark, or whoever the gospel writer was, did not know Jesus personally, but he had heard a lot of stories that must have affected him deeply. In the Easter season, I like to reread Mark's narrative of events following the crucifixion of Jesus. In the 16th, and final chapter of Mark, three women go to the tomb in which Jesus's body has been placed, but his body is not there. Instead, a young man clothed in white greets them. Mark does say that Jesus has been raised, but not that his body or his soul is in a heavenly sphere with his father, capital F. But later, when someone or <clears throat> some ones had added verses 9 through 16 to the text, Jesus has been, quote, 
taken up to heaven, and he sits down at the right hand of God. In contrast, here are the final verses of the original text. The text, that is, that was written closer to the life and death of Jesus. Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of Jesus, and Salome are frightened. The young man in white clothing is quoted as saying, oh, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He, he's not there. Look, uh, there is the place they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And so ends the original version of the Gospel of Mark. And now we will have the offering. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to create a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. The weekly offering serves as an ongoing reminder of this mission. Sharing in this weekly practice of generosity also strengthens the bonds between congregants and our high purpose. So let there be an offering in support of this beloved community and our good work. Contributions can be made through our website, Venmo, username at BUCMI, or a check in the mail. However you choose to give, please do so with a heart of gratitude and for each other. The Ave Verum Corpus composed by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart in 1791, is a reverent, beautiful piece that uh, he composed just a few months before his own death. This enduring piece of music is a gift to you, BUC, from 13 members of your BUC Chalice Choir, who together recorded almost 40 tracks, which were then knit into this morning's offertory music. Happy, thoughtful, hopeful spring.
each morning on Sundays, we set aside time for the reading of joys and sorrows that have written, been written and brought to our attention for the entire congregation to hear. During the reading of the sorrow that we have today, the recording will be turned off in order to honor the privacy of the individual. And now let's take a moment to reflect in quiet with words spoken about continuity, rebirth, and ongoing. We bear witness to life and to life re-emerging. Wherever we look, we see daffodils and tulips and forsythia, buds on trees, and we know that life in nature continues and reasserts itself. We bear witness to the holiness of this season. Our spirits are lifted. In the words of Leonard Mason, we affirm the unfailing renewal of life. Rising from the earth and reaching for the sun, all living creatures fulfill themselves. We affirm the steady growth of human companionship. We affirm continuing hope. And please now, in your own silence, think upon these words of continuation of hope and of healing. story to share with you all this morning. When I was growing up, my family was Catholic. And so the week before Easter, we'd go shopping for new Easter dresses to wear on Sunday mass. And the Easter story was simply something I was obligated to sit through before returning home to find my Easter basket. When my family found their way to Unitarian Universalism and my interest in social justice grew, I began to think about this Easter story in a different way. The core events have not changed, but the lens through which I view it has. And the story goes like this. Jesus was a beloved teacher from long ago. He liked to travel around sharing stories and learning from people, including people that others thought were dirty or lesser. He was poor and Jewish and believed in loving thy neighbor and helping one another. 
Through this message, Jesus attracted a lot of followers, including 12 young men called disciples, who learned all they could from Jesus and helped him share his message. Eventually, Jesus became so popular that the head priests and some people in the government began to feel threatened. They worried that this radical change maker and his band of activists would change the balance of power in the land, and they were afraid of losing their power. And so they decided to kill Jesus. One of the disciples, Judas, went to the priests and betrayed Jesus. I can help you arrest Jesus, he said, but I want something in return. And the priests agreed to this deal and they gave Judas 30 pieces of silver in exchange for him helping catch Jesus. And later as Jesus celebrated Passover with his disciples, he revealed that he knew that one of his disciples had betrayed him. He knew also that another disciple, Peter, would later pretend not to know Jesus at all. And the next morning, Ju Judas led the authorities straight to Jesus and he was arrested. His other disciples were afraid and they all ran away. Jesus was taken to court where the priests presented lots of false evidence and brought witnesses who could lie about bad things that Jesus hadn't actually done. They accused Jesus of speaking blasphemy that is, of teaching things that were counter to the teachings of the temple. And for this, they sentenced Jesus to death. And meanwhile, three different people approached Peter and asked him whether he knew Jesus. Peter was afraid of being arrested just like Jesus was, and so three times he pretended he had never met Jesus. And by the time the morning came, Peter remembered that Jesus predicted this would happen, and he felt so sad to have betrayed his friend. So Jesus was beaten and nailed to a cross, and for three days he hung there as people yelled insults and mocked him for his teachings. And on the day we now call Good Friday, Jesus died. His body was buried in a tomb closed by a giant stone for a door. His friends mourned his death and missed him dearly. And then the story goes, three days later on what we now call Easter Sunday, Jesus rose miraculously from the dead. The giant stone over his tomb cracked in half and an angel appeared. Jesus met with his disciples at Galilee and asked them to continue spreading his message of love and justice. And then Jesus ascended into heaven. This story is very important to Christians who believe that Jesus was truly the Son of God and that he really did come back to life. Many Unitarian Universalists find different themes in this story, not so much the miracles and God, but many UUs tend to focus on the idea of fighting against oppression, even when it requires sacrifice, or the idea that we miss people who have died. This Easter Sunday, I'm not waiting for this story to get over so I can get on to the commercialized aspects of today, although I do love a good chocolate bunny. Instead, I'm thinking about how this story might partner with my Unitarian Universalism to guide my fight for justice. I'm reminded of how complicated it is to be part of a community that cares about justice and how sometimes we really do have to get through Good Friday to get to Easter Sunday. Thank you, Nico. Thank you for bringing us up to date on the new version of what the Easter Sunday story is all about. The scientists have their own theories about the eternal. So let's go on in this subject and think about the everlasting from a secular and scientific point of view. Our bodies are composed of atoms. To quote one writer, our body is a universe within a universe. In our death, the atoms that define our physical selves find other things to do, other combinations to make, other places to go. 
As I understand the theory, our atoms were created by the Big Bang of 13.8 billion years ago, if one can just get one's head around such a number. So, atoms in the body form molecules, and when our body dies, the molecules begin to disintegrate. But the atoms that make up those fundamental groupings continue to exist. It is as though they return to the earth to locate in plants and trees and other life forms. It is as though they look around for buddies to form new molecules. And this becomes one facet of our secular understanding of life everlasting. Even though most of our atoms will stay right here on this little blue and white marble floating in space, some atoms, who witness helium atoms, are so weightless that they can escape Earth's gravity. By doing so, they float off into space drifting off to Jupiter or stars in distant galaxies. So putting it in poetic imagery, we are made of the stuff of stars and to star stuff we shall return. In the last analysis, however, I doubt that I shall worry as my own death approaches about the disposition of my helium atoms. If I think much at all, it will probably be on ending relationships, on the end of character, on the oncoming failure to do any good to and for myself or others in the future. In other words, I expect to be in the grip of life ending not moving into another sphere as presented in Dante's Divine Comedy, a medieval presentation of hell, purgatory, and heaven. Now, I still remember when I was five years old, my grandfather Sharples died and grandma taught me the rudiments of prayer. Rudiments I did not analyze at age five, but accepted my faith. After all, my grandma wanted me to be able to protect myself in dire circumstances. So she taught and I memorized, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, clearly there was a father figure. A father figure was in that prayer, perhaps someone who looked like my dad. But in the prayer, this person-like figure's name was Hallowed, which sounded pretty special. Even though I was not sure what a Hallowed name would sound like or mean. Probably something more special than Ed, or my friend Larry across the road. And I understood that there was a kingdom that belonged to the Father, capital F. And he really, really wanted me to be perfect because, well, because he wanted me to be perfect. And there was another prayer, this one much shorter, that I was also taught to say every night not kneeling by the bed in the unheated room of winter, but while in bed, covered by layers of blankets, 
hands across my chest, I had an insurance policy. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I was covered by more than blankets. Even if the very worst thing happened, even if I died that night, the Lord would somehow keep me safe. That prayer protected me. It was my insurance blanket. Well, years later, <laughs> Diane and I were to see the print of a painting. Now the subject was death and several grieving figures surrounded the bed on which the deceased lay. What startled both of us was a whitish, translucent figure at an angle of 30 or 40 degrees or so was rising from the body. It must have been the way the painter wanted to tell a story about a transition. What he was saying to Diane and me was, have faith. This is what happens when the body no longer functions. The soul has been developed in this human all his life. And now the soul is released as your childhood prayers said it would be. And then I thought, if I should die, before I wake, I pray the Lord, my soul to take. It was what I had learned as a child. And there in front of us was its representation. The representation of a soul leaving the body. It was about 20 years after that that Reverend Hurt asked one day, Ed, how do you define soul? Well, I didn't know where or why that question came from, but I felt obliged to say something. So I said, well, the soul is the product of the human brain and spirit moves it to action. I don't think I've improved on that non-dictionary definition of soul, but I do feel with some confidence that soul is not a translucent form that resides in the human body. Not a some thing that is released at death. In a spiritual level, does life everlasting have anything substantial to say? Or do we just define it by negatives? Oh, don't be silly. There's nothing after, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I often think of unintended consequences. There's a very old story about butterfly wings. Do you remember it? The fluttering of a butterfly's wings may start a series of physical actions that create a tornado in Texas, or maybe change the weather halfway around the globe in Malaysia. When I was teaching, 
I was intensely aware that I did not know what was going on in the minds of my students in my classroom. Were they understanding and appreciating the text? Were they feeling the text as did I? And I wanted each one to feel the splendor of language. But a teacher never knows. Henry Adams put it nicely when he wrote, a teacher affects eternity. He, please forgive the male pronoun, he can never tell where his influence stops. My, my, my. A teacher affects eternity. Well, the truth of the matter is that we shouldn't just talk about teachers and professors in a profession as those who affect eternity by their actions, by their words. To me, it's very clear that everything we do affects eternity. If we are parents and we gather around the kitchen table to talk through a problem with our sons or daughters, we are affecting eternity. If we get up at a meeting of the Board of Education and talk about something that we want or don't want, we are affecting eternity. There is no way around what we say or what we do that does not affect eternity. My older son has done a lot of work on genealogy because he wants to know where our family came from. He's gone back on one side to the 15th century. And some of the genetic structure of generations ago resides in him. And looking forward, part of my sons will be contained within their sons and daughters as long as time permits. It is a fundamental part of the everlasting. So what then of this concept of eternity? Physicists have their models, bleak though they are to the faint of heart. They seem to tell me that everything that begins must have an end, not simply of things that live, but even of the blue and white marble floating in space and of the end of the cosmos as well. But at least for now, I think of continuations and trust we shall all make mistakes. And when they happen, we have the power to change their consequences. We can be caring, not careless, helpful, not hurtful, givers, not takers. If we do our best in the now, in this moment, that like the blink of an eye between past and future, perhaps that is all we can do. Thoreau said, there is eternity in each moment. You must live in the present. Launch yourself on every wave. Find your eternity in each moment. And then there's Emily Dickinson, who writes, forever is composed of now. Tis not a different time from this that we experience here. Our 
eternity is right here in this moment, this moment of now. We can never go back. There are no do-overs. And the future is but a glimmer of grief, misery, sadness, as well as a glimmer of accomplishment, successes, and joy. Yes, we are made for joy and sorrow. We are preparing the future even now, even as we live it, even at this very moment, because forever is composed of now. Tis not a different time from this experienced here. May it be so, and amen. Please join and stand, if you're willing and able, to join in song for our final hymn on this Easter Sunday. It's number 1008, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, when we trust the wisdom in each of us, every color, every creed and kind, and we see our faces in each other's eyes, then our heart is in Listen with a loving mind And we hear our voices in each other's words Then our heart is in a holy place When our heart is in a holy place When our heart is in a holy place We are blessed with love and amazing grace When our heart is in a holy place is taken from Brian Green, a brilliant physicist, who gives us this morning's closing words. He ends his book until the end of time by writing this. So in our quest to fathom the human condition, the only direction to look is inward. That is the noble direction. It foregoes ready-made answers and turns to constructing our own meaning. Science grasps external realities, but everything else, everything else is the human species contemplating itself grasping what it needs to carry on and telling a story that at its best 
stirs the soul. May life and joy be with you until we meet again.